Culture is where art and commerce meet. It's the point when you have something that is highly creative, strikes a chord, and then turns into commercial success, you know, is in culture. And all those associations, when you tie it in with a very iconic design, is like gasoline on the fire. Hi, I'm Eli Woolery. And I'm Aaron Walter. Our guest today, Robert Bruner, once joked that his tombstone will read, here lies the guy who hired Johnny Ive. But hey, there's more to Robert than just that. He did indeed build out the industrial design team at Apple in the 1990s, but he's also been a partner at Pentagram Design and was the chief designer of Beats by Dre, a brand that sold to Apple for $3 billion. We talk with Robert about the arc of his career, what it takes to run a successful design consulting business, and why great products are more about ideas than objects. Before we jump into the episode, we've got something new to share with you. We just released the first issue of our monthly newsletter. It includes a really great guest post from April Llewelling, former senior product design recruiter and product manager at Meta, who shares tips on working with recruiters as well as current job openings in the design world. It's really timely stuff. We also share highlights from some of our recent interviews and links to interesting tools and a few summer reads. You can subscribe for free to the newsletter and also get the podcast a week early at designbetterpodcast.com. That's designbetterpodcast.com. Thanks for subscribing and for listening. With Freehand by Envision, we've built a best-in-class visual collaboration platform used by thousands of enterprise customers, inclusively priced for the whole organization at 50% the cost of Miro and Mural, and now with the Intelligent Canvas, allowing teams to maximize their impact by adding intelligence, automation, and connection to the canvas. Try Freehand by Envision today for free at freehandapp.com. This episode is brought to you by Fable, who make it easy to build accessible, inclusive products. Learn more at makeitfable.com and later on in the show. Robert Brunner, welcome to the Design Better podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. We're really excited to have you. And you have a really interesting career over the years going from co-founding the agency Lunar being at Apple, to uh, founding Ammunition and working with Dr. Dre on the Beats headphones. But let's rewind to the very beginning. What got you into industrial design? Well, that, that, that's a great story. I mean, one thing that's always nice when you get a little older, you kind of can look back through the lens of where you are today and realize, you know, what happened to get you there. And for me, it actually starts in my childhood. In many ways, I was a child of innovation. Uh, my father was a very accomplished engineer who invented a lot of the mechanical technology in the first disk drives at IBM. And he was always making something, right? That was just part of our living. So was my mom. My mother was a, originally a, a model who became a homemaker, but was always a fine artist and craftsperson and eventually an entrepreneur and started her own children's clothing company. You know, our house was filled with mid-century modern Danish teak furniture, right? And I, I, I didn't know. I just thought we were different. I didn't, you know, it's fine. You know, all my friends had different furniture, but it just, it was sort of the environment I grew up in where that was my surroundings and everything was a project, right? It just, that was, it was like a project-based family. When I completed high school, you know, I did the classic talk to the career counselor and he looked at my grades and says, you, you know, you, you, you do well in math and science. Your dad's an engineer. You're an engineer you know, go study engineering. (laughs) He never looked at my grades in art, never looked at my grades in shop class. It's where always straight A's, right? I decided to go to San Jose State and entered the engineering program, hated it, and thought I'd rebel and go to my mother's side of the family and took a walk over the art building. I'd heard about this thing called graphic design, you know, which was some form of commercial art. And I thought, well, that could be cool. And I, I walked in the art building and I, luckily I went in the door I did because I was presented with this display case full of industrial design work, you know, of renderings and sketches and models. And then I just, you know, like instantly knew, okay, this is it, right? This is the thing, you know, that I, because I, you know, spent most of my youth in the garage by myself building bicycles and things. So I walked over the administration building and changed my major, which I always say, like if I'd gone in another door, right, I could be a, 
starving sculptor today or something like that. So it was a, a bit of a, you know, you can see your life path kind of how it was laid out for you. Uh, but never look back, you know, and, and pissed my dad off. He hated the idea of industrial design. He thought it was, you know, just stylists who knew nothing about functionality and usually screwed things up. That was his engineering viewpoint. But he came around eventually. But they, yeah, that was how I, you know, I ended up in the industrial design program at San Jose State, which also, even though it was a state school, you know, which, you know, aren't always the best funded schools, I actually had at that time a really good program in industrial design, very practical, very driven by outside professionals. So I just, you know, just really stumbled onto something that really was a, a springboard for getting started in this field. So then I'm, I'm assuming you, you got some work and then you eventually started uh, an agency called Lunar and people might know Lunar more recently for having been acquired by McKinsey, but you were one of the co-founders. Maybe tell us a story about how that came about. Yeah. So I was in school and my roommate was Gerard Furbishaw, one of the other founders of Lunar. And he was working in the model shop at a company called GVO, which was a uh, for a while, like back in the uh, early 80s, was probably the biggest design firm in, in the Silicon Valley. And so he got me a job. And I worked there in the shop and kind of made my way out of the shop just, you know, by sort of forcing my way onto other projects. And Gerard and I worked together closely and also met this other guy at GBO named Jeff Smith, who's the third founder of Lunar. And we, we all worked together really well. And we, we had one of these sort of very synergistic relationships where... Gerard was the technical guy. Jeff was sort of the process thinker, and I was the creative individual. And we kind of meshed really well together. So we we did the classic. You know, we would uh, meet after hours at the uh, pizza parlor across the freeway from you know, and talk about what we're going to do. There was actually another guy, at GVO, named Peter Lowe, who was the business development guy. He wanted to start a company, and somehow he figured out we were thinking about it. So we first joined Peter. That didn't really work out. So we just kind of went out on our own and started Lunar, literally with no money, a couple very small clients. We found a really cheap, really shitty space in Menlo Park, you know, out on the other side of 101. And we just started, you know, with, with literally like, I mean, literally a few thousand dollars. Didn't pay ourselves for a long time. But that, that was how we started Lunar. And it was really just pure youthful stupidity and, <laughs> and just go do it. And, you know, we managed over the course of a few years to put together a really strong studio. So fast forward a few years, it's 1989, and you get an opportunity to join Apple at, you know, a pretty significant point in its history. What was that like as you joined Apple? And you were there till 96, right? Leading industrial design? Uh, no, yeah, 97, I think it was, yeah. 97? Early 97, yeah. Yeah, so Lunar got going nicely. I think we had a team of 20 people working in a variety of things and, you know, sort of classic early Silicon Valley startup work mostly. And there was a guy who we knew named Bill Dresselhaus. He had worked on the original Lisa at Apple and he was back at Apple as a mechanical consultant and product design and working on a program that was sort of a next generation platform kind of thing. And he asked us to do some work on it, but it, but it was really interesting. It was kind of filled with intrigue because at the time, Apple was in the relationship with Frog Design. It was a very tight contractual relationship, very singular relationship. And so we were instructed not to call anything we did industrial design. It was all engineering work, right? Engineering explorations. I didn't realize at the time, but they were kind of testing the waters, uh, working with other people. And so we did the work. It went well. Started doing some more things. In the, in the meantime, the frog relationship sort of came to an end. And so I started working on mainstream Apple projects, which were, for me was a dream, right? Just to be involved in, in working with Apple. And it continued for a few years. And the main guy I, I worked with was a guy named Richard Jordan, who ran the organization, which was called Product Design, which was really sort of mechanical engineering, mechanical design and industrial design together. They had a very small internal design team, which was largely geared around managing people outside the organization, the other consultants like myself. So Richard was tasked to find a new design leader and he, he had his headhunter contact me, which was weird because I said, why didn't he just do it? But I was the, the channels. And so I talked to them a little bit and said, no, I, I turned the job down. 
simply because it was being presented to me as sort of continuation of what they're doing currently and working with other outside designers, finding a replacement for Frog and so forth. And I saw myself as a designer, not as a manager per se. So I said no. And that kind of shocked them. But, you know, it was in reality, it was the best thing I could have done. So I went back to doing what I'm doing. We we're still working on some Apple stuff, our other, other clients. And then they came back about three months later and said, no, you know, we talk to other people. We really want you. So what would that take? And stupid me, I didn't at all think about money. <laughs> I just said, if any company could support a world-class internal design organization, it would be Apple. So if you want to do that, I'd be interested. And so they said, okay, let's do that. And jump back into interviewing with Jean-Louis Gasset and, kind of, and then I took the job and went off and built the internal design team. And, you know, it was one of those things like, watch out for what you ask for. You might just get it, you know, <laughs> and walked into a, an amazing mess to uh, try and figure out how to turn it into a functioning internal design group, but managed to do it. There's a line that we, Aaron and I ran across, which was pretty funny from an interview with you in 2013, you, you said, I sometimes joke that when I die, my tombstone will say, here lies a guy who hired Johnny Ive. But it's cool. I mean, it's cool to hear that, you know, you played a part in like bringing design kind of back into Apple. And then you know, obviously their trajectory went from there. So what were some of the like, kind of struggles and challenges around that when you first came in? Well, you know, when I first came in, I remember being really depressed, right? Because I reported to the building I was going to work in, which wasn't even on the main Apple campus, was in Santa Clara, about a 10 minute drive away in a classic Silicon Valley tilt up, very few windows. I was plopped down in my eight by 10 cubicle and just feeling like, you know, with Herman Miller action office, beige panels, and just thought, what have I done? You know, it's just, I was having a lot of fun and here I am, you know sitting in the sea of engineers, and it's kind of up to me to figure it out. So one of the first things I did, I don't know where I came upon this, and I think it just was sort of natural, again, going back to my upbringing of this sort of, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness kind of approach. And I just decided we need, the first thing I needed was a good studio. I'm not going to get any talent to come and work where I was sitting. And for me also, I just, you know, the environment that I sit in has a lot to do with how I feel and how creative I feel. And so I just went out and I found a building that was empty over in Cupertino and I managed to uh, cozy up to the environments group and got them to figure out how to fund working out. You know, I, so I did all this on my own without even asking anybody's permission and, and eventually went to Richard and said, Hey, I'm going to do this. After he got over being pissed off at me, he said, okay, oh, well, this makes sense. So uh, we set up this new studio, open space, more of a design physical architecture. And, you know, so that was, that was the first thing, but simultaneously I had to figure out how to recruit the talent that I needed into the organization. At that time proved to be more challenging than, than you would think because the perception of Apple had come from, you know, Frog had such a very strong visibility. That was number one, that it was, you know, what's going on. Apple works with outside people. And then secondarily was this sort of, view of the world of personal computing, which had really evolved into beige boxes, right? That at that time, through even what Apple had done, Apple was doing very nice beige boxes, but they were beige boxes. And the rest of the world was following suit to the IBM PC. It was a challenge getting people to, designers to look at the potential of coming to actually work inside of Apple. So we did something that was kind of very fun and interesting that we bought the back cover of ID Magazine, I think for six issues. And we developed a number of sort of crazy design concepts that weren't something that were was on the roadmap, you know, with Apple or anything. It was just, and again, I don't know how I managed to do this. I would have been fired if I did that today. And we published these works, you know, of just some crazy arm held thing, things wearing arm, arm worn things, things on bicycles, so forth. And just presented this idea that there's something interesting going on here. Really no words, nothing, just these pictures with, you have these concepts with Apple logos on them. And it worked. It started to create some energy, managed to hire a couple good people. That's just starting. So, you know, over, over the course of uh, 18 months, was able to get some really amazing designers to join the team. Danny Dulis, Tim Parsi, Johnny, you know, where I was able to get them into the organization. And we started building an incredible team. So those, I think, were the two key things. And then, of course, figuring out 
how to make this organization functional within a, you know, very complex, very political organizational molecule that was an entirely engineering driven company. You know, while Apple was lauded for its user focused approach, it's an engineering and technology driven company. And so getting in there and trying to figure out how to actually become more design driven internally presented a challenge on its own. Were there still vestiges of the Jobsian design philosophy about, you know, making everything beautiful, even, you know, the circuit boards that customers will never see? Were those design philosophies still present at Apple when you arrived or was, was that something you were reshaping? No, they, they were there. It was, it was under attack though. I mean, it, it was, you know, that's something I often say about a big advantage of going to a place like Apple, you know, even when you know, you'd walk into the cafeteria, you know, where they have those bulletin boards where you know, things are put up and usually it's like, you know, goldenrod paper with, you know, 20 different typefaces or whatever, you know, and, and you walk into Apple and, you know, Creative Services has designed everything that's up on that bulletin board, right? And that continued in this sort of uh, attention to detail, but it was under attack, right? The challenge of the period that I was there, which when Jobs came back, he reversed, was that the company was really taking on an industry, right? It was taking on the Wintel industry, Windows and Intel, right? That was not just a single company, it was many, many companies driving a platform. And Apple was standing alone with the Mac operating system and its own proprietary hardware trying to win in that space, right? And then start to play in every possible market from education to Fortune 500 and consumer and everything in between. So it really stretched the company and it began to challenge a lot of the things that existed from before where taking the time to do things right, investing in things that, you know, couldn't be measured on in Excel, right? All these things that, you know, that the company just did. And there was an influx of managers from companies like Hewlett Packard, Sun Microsystems, others that, you know, weren't necessarily design driven companies, again, more technology driven companies. So it became really challenging to do good work, right? And, and just those things that were there as sort of the way Apple did things were constantly under challenge. And then maybe talk to us a little bit. You, you transitioned out of Apple and you, were, you started working at Pentagram. And I think for a lot of us, Pentagram is more well known for brand design and graphic design than industrial design. So what attracted you to that company? Then that's absolutely right. And that's an important thing to talk about. They, um, so, you know, at Apple, you know, I'd been there about seven years and the job just wasn't that much fun anymore. And the leadership was transitioning. So it went from Gasset to Scully. Most of my time there was under with Scully and, and he was very uh, much a design proponent. Scully left and it was Michael Spindler came from the operations side and also a great man, but really didn't understand design. You know, and again, there was this just sort of corporate policy of we're going to, we're going to play in everything where the number of SKUs that we're working on was huge. And the amount of time and money we had to invest in them was per project was dwindling. And, you know, I was spending you know, out of my work week, four out of five days in meetings, right? <laughs> and just not feeling, feeling like I was atrophying as a creative person. So I thought, I've learned a lot here, time to change again. And I thought, okay, I'm going to start another office, right? You know, but honestly, at that point, the idea of um, going out and, and leasing another a color copier and finding a space and doing those things, it just wasn't that appealing. So I was invited to a luncheon at the Museum of Modern Art up in San Francisco, and I went, and I sat next to a gentleman named Kit Heinrichs, who was a partner in the San Francisco office of Pentagram. And we had a nice conversation, and he said this, you know, classic, hey, we're looking to bring on another industrial design partner. Do you know anybody? You know, nod, nod, wink, wink. And, well, it's interesting for me, you know, because yeah, you're absolutely right that Pentagram is primarily a, an organization driven by graphic design. But... One of my early influences was a designer named Kenneth Grange. And my first job, I mentioned GVO, I, I found this book on Kenneth's work in the library, and especially around the, the appliances that he'd done for Kenwood, which I thought were amazing. You know, so for me, I had this notion, and Kenneth was one of the original five of Pentagram, hence the name Pentagram. You know, so I had this, I, you know, vision in my head of Pentagram being about industrial design because of Kenneth. And so at the time, Kenneth was nearing retirement in London. 
There was another partner, an industrial designer named Danny Vile, who was a real talented guy, but really not so much a hardcore product guy. I mean, he tended to do a lot of work in environments and sort of different angle. And so I thought, well, great, I'll go to San Francisco office, I'll build an industrial design team. Pentagram as a, as a business model is, is really interesting. In many ways, you know, Pentagram is structured like a law firm rather than a design firm, and that you have partners at the time it was I was there were 19 partners, each with their own area of expertise, per se, each with their own clients, each with their own teams, each with their own PL, actually. So you acted like your own business within a larger umbrella. You know, and you had the platform of Pentagram from a brand point of view, but also operationally. So it actually made really great sense for me that I could join this organization with structure and resources and capital and go off and build my business out of that. So I did that, which was great. It was, it was for 10 years. It was fantastic. Some of the smartest, most creative people I've ever worked with in my life, the other partners that are still great friends today. I actually just attended the company's 50th anniversary party. So it, it is, you know, the oldest design company in the world and still thriving and growing, right? Which is, is actually, it's, it's a testament to Colin Forbes' model, the, the original Pentagram partnership model, that it's, it's basically self-renewing. So yeah, I did that and it was, it was great. It was a great learning experience. And like I said, just working with really amazing people that just were at, completely at the top of their game. And uh, I, I learned so much doing that. That's fascinating. What did you learn from Pentagram? It's 10 years and you had a lot of autonomy there. Were there key takeaways from that experience? Yeah, and it, and it really is important as it shapes up to where I am now and that I really began to understand, especially working with people like Paula Scher and Michael Beirut, who while they're largely practicing graphic design, they're actually not only incredibly talented, but incredibly strategic thinkers. I, I began to see how you didn't just use design at a very high level to chart the course of a, of a company and a brand, but also to communicate that, right? To business leaders, you know, turn this sort of very touchy-feely arts-based thing that I'm doing into business advantage and then have people understand that. It was like, you know, getting an MBA in design leadership and watching those guys work. And so, the, so that for me, that was one of the big things, you know, and the, and the organizations that the company worked with, while, while I did still continue to do some work with startups, you know, I was working with Nike and Microsoft and UPS and Tiffany and United Airlines. And so that was largely the clientele. While there were a lot of things I didn't like about that, it was, it was again, a great learning experience to figure out how you navigate and get good work through big organizations like that. And that's a very different model. So, you know, seven, eight years at Apple where you're internal, where you've got a single client working on lots of different projects and shifting over to Pentagram where you've got lots of different clients, very diverse set of work. Did you have like a preference or did, how did it kind of feed your creativity, those two different models? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because in many ways they weren't. You know, I was a consultant before, and that's what I knew how to do. And I knew how to build a studio that way. So that's kind of what I did at Apple. And, and that, you know, the way I, I viewed Apple is it wasn't we had one client. We had about six or seven clients, right? We had different business units, each with their own leadership, each with their own teams, own structure, own different directions or motivations. So, you know, I, I structured the team at Apple as, a, you know, we had a core creative group we called the studio. And then I identified, you know, what were essentially account managers, I call them product line leaders, but they were account managers for each of those different groups. And so we ran it very much like a consulting firm, except for in the part that we really owned the strategic direction of the brand from an industrial design point of view. And so going to Pentagram wasn't that big of a shift. The difference is obviously the politics and the internal struggle at Apple was huge, right? It was, I mean, really, you know, pretty much became my job, which was one of the reasons I wanted to move on, was that I spent most of my time trying to figure out either how to convince, cajole, or force someone to do something, right? <laughs> and which was, you know, absolutely super valuable thing to learn how to do, but not always the most pleasant job. But then, so then continuing to Pentagram, you know, again, had a creative studio. Probably the most interesting thing that I learned, in addition to, you know, working with people like 
Paul and Michael was, you know, how do you again, go back and build a book of business and build clients and build relationships, you know, cause I quickly got up to about 18 people, which was a large team within Pentagram. Most of the partners had anywhere from one to six designers under them creating that much business and maintaining it, you know, while still wanting to be a creative lead is challenging. So I, I, I figured out some important things about business development that have still continue to serve me today. So that was a big part of that journey was just figuring out how to build that business and keep it running and growing. Sounds like maybe you, you took some of those learnings when you, you left in 2007 and started ammunition. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing I, it was interesting because I, I went through this thing, you know, which a lot of people do of, you know, when you're having your small consulting firm is, you know, how do you do business development? How do you get things to happen? You know, so Pentagram had an advantage because the brand was so strong. But as you said, in the very beginning, it was largely known as from a graphic design point of view. And, you know, so I had hired a couple business development people, you know, that would just call up and do the usual cold calling or just trying to, you know, build new business. And it never worked, right? It never really, to me, was not a sustainable model, at least in how I wanted to work. And, and I finally figured out that there are two things that were really important to business growth in what I was doing, and they were visibility and relationships. And you had to invest in both of those. You had to invest in making yourself and your work very visible as much as you could through competitions, through public speaking, through whatever ways of publishing your work and getting it out there. And then the second was that, and this is something that I learned from Colin Forbes. He said to me once, you know, your best business development opportunities are in your existing address book, right? And you know, what he meant was, you know, that those relationships you had, you go back to those relationships and continue to grow them because those people leave and go somewhere else, or they will tell somebody else they worked with this guy and he's amazing. And so it really invest in those relationships and maintaining them and growing them and then building them. So that, you know, for me was a big learning and that's what I really started to do. And that's, you know, turned out to be the most sustainable model for running a design consulting business was really focusing on those two areas. We'll return to the conversation after this quick break. Methodical crafts coffee and tea for people of all kinds. They've been around and roasting for more than eight years, and they are certified coffee nerds. On their site, you'll find useful brewing guides that'll teach you how to turn your coffee brewing chore into a beloved ritual and really dial in that perfect cup. I'm a longtime subscriber to the Roaster's Choice subscription and start every day with a cup of methodical coffee. I have to say, without fail, every morning when I wake up, I am excited to drink their coffee because it is fantastic. Methodical's packaging, their website, the entire experience, it's just beautifully designed. Craft a cup that you'll love with Methodical Coffee by visiting methodicalcoffee.com and use our discount code DESIGNBETTER to get 10% off your first order of coffee or tea. That's methodicalcoffee.com. I've got two young kids who can be a little bit on the noisy side, so my wife and I have gotten used to using closed captions on those rare occasions when we get a chance to sit down and watch a show together. Lots of us have experienced the benefits of products that were initially designed for people with disabilities, from closed captions to dark mode on your phone or laptop, to voice to text, to electric toothbrushes. Designing products for all people, regardless of abilities, leads to greater adaptability, usability, customization, and personalization. With 1 billion people worldwide living with disabilities, Fable Engage helps UX teams collect feedback from people with disabilities to help you build more accessible products. Fable Upskill provides custom accessibility training for digital teams to gain skills to build inclusive products. The best digital teams like Shopify, Microsoft, and Spotify partner with Fable to make better products for everyone. We're big fans of Fable, and we know you will be too. Learn more by requesting a demo at www.makeitfable.com slash design better. That's www.makeitfable.com slash Design better. You may have seen driverless cars around. Maybe you've even ridden in one yourself. The future is here with Cruise. Cruise is building an all electric fleet of the world's most advanced self driving vehicles to safely connect people to the things, 
people, and places that they care about the most. At Cruise, they're designing experiences that will set a new standard in transportation, tools that enable a safe, smooth ride, and a service that is making a positive impact, one community at a time. Here's the good news. Cruise is hiring. You want to join their collaborative team? Visit design.getcruise.com to learn more about how you can help design the future of transportation. Again, that's design.getcruise.com. Design.getcruise.com to learn more. And now, back to the show. I'm curious, on the visibility side, I'm guessing uh, that your partnership with Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, I'm guessing that was great on the visibility side. What brought about that relationship? Yeah, that's a really fun one. So that actually started at Pentagram and uh, really wild. So I, uh, I was contacted by a third party who was interested in developing audio products with celebrities. And, you know, he had heard that Dr. Dre was interested in creating audio products. So he made this introduction and went down and had a, a meeting with Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre and, and Luke Wood, which was, again, for me, it was crazy, right? So here I am, I'm just Silicon Valley design nerd, you know, going down to Santa Monica to meet with these guys. You know, they wanted to develop audio products. And, you know, Jimmy's story, as he told it, he liked to tell this story, was that Adidas had approached Dre about doing some footwear. And Dre and Jimmy are and continue to be super tight from a business point of view. And Jimmy says his comment to Dre was, quote unquote, fuck sneakers, let's do speakers. And um, Jimmy had had the experience working with Apple doing the, uh, the YouTube iPod. I don't know if you guys remember that. It came out as black and red and the, the band had signed the back and Jimmy was representing U2. And so they did that together. And it was a great experience for Jimmy. And he, you know, he had it in his mind that he could do um, technology products and was, was really interested in doing this. And it, Jimmy's brilliant, actually. I'm one of the smartest people I've ever worked with, one of the most, most challenging people I've ever worked with. But, you know, what he saw was that for his audience, right, a uh, younger audience, interested in hip hop and rock music, that there was no high performance audio brand. It just, it didn't exist, right? There was, you know, Bose was, I always say it was your dad's headphone. All the other companies were somewhat esoteric or very, very much focused on audio files. You know, Skull Candy was sort of very, very inexpensive and not good quality, right? So it just didn't exist. If you were a young person and wanted a really good pair of headphones, you just, there weren't, weren't any options. And, and so in the, back to that first meeting, Dre said something, which we ended up putting on the box for years, which, you know, was asked him, so what, why, why are you doing this? And he said, people aren't hearing my music. What he meant was that the way that he would produce a song, it would go out into the world, but the way people listen to it didn't represent it right, right? And he made this, ironically, this comment about they go out and listen to it on those crappy white earbuds, which I thought was ironic with the crappy white earbud company bought them. But, you know, so, so that was really his impetus was, and, and Jimmy's too, is that, look, we produce a majority of the popular music out there, right? They knew how it was supposed to sound, right? It was for them, it was kind of a secret weapon. They understood what the sound profile was supposed to be. So they wanted to produce products that represented that appropriately. And so that became kind of the driving force behind it. And they knew they wanted them to be designed well, so they brought, brought me into it, which was really weird. And it was kind of funny because we actually got along really well right from the very beginning, um, which was, again, sort of surprising to me, you know, these guys that I would, you know, actually become friends with fairly quickly. But we went off and we did one of these classics, went away for two weeks and came back with a bunch of ideas. And I remember this being shockingly refreshing, you know. So we did this thing where we laid all these probably, you know, 15 different ideas out on the table. And the normal thing you would do is you kind of walk through those and talk about it and try and get it down to like three or four, right? That you would sort of go off and put invest more time into. And we went through them all and they looked at them and both Jimmy and Dre walked over to this one rendering and pointed at it and said, that one, let's do that one. (laughs) And I said, you don't want to do, no, no, we want to do that one. Right. And it was, uh, it was an outline of what became the original studio. 
And the idea behind it that I had was when, when I looked out at all the headphones that were out on the market, you know, they were all driven by functionality, you know, right, rightfully so, right? I mean, the headphones that you're wearing, they have to be comfortable. They have to fit people in, in a numerous number of different dimensions. They have to be very adjustable. They have to be very durable, undergo a lot of stress and abuse. The acoustics drive a lot of the design. The hardware that's inside it drive a lot of design. So, you know, everything ended up, but I looked, was this sort of very mechanical, articulated things on people's heads, right? So I had this, I printed out a picture of a sort of classic headphone, and I threw my tracing paper over it, and I drew a single line from ear to ear. And I said, well, that's what I want to achieve. I want to get all that stuff all that functional stuff that's super important, but into this very sort of streamlined single element. And then, you know, what we, the other thing we did, which I think was original, but surprisingly so, was we actually designed them on heads, right? We did all our sketches, all our CAD models, everything. We took the idea of how does it look on the body as one of the boundary conditions, right? And so out of that, you know, came this idea of studio, which you know, once we had this idea, then implementing mechanically to get all that functional stuff to work properly was, was a huge challenge. It took a long time, but it, it really set forth a, a direction which actually changed the entire business, changed the entire industry. You know, it was, it was amazing that after we launched Studio, you know, two years later, when you go to the Consumer Electronics Show, 75% of it, <laughs> the headphones you would see had some derivative of that design, you know, within two years. It was mind-boggling. Honestly, it was structured as a, more of a partnership than a, a sort of fee-for-service thing. It was basically um, we were going to receive a share of revenue off the products, which you know I, I came to later understand that's just how they did business, right? When you go out and craft a song and bring it to market, you know everybody takes a cut, right? That's just you know, the producer, the artist, the label, right? So that's how they wanted to do it. And I, I just thought, well, you know, hopefully I'll make my money back. Because right? I would have been happy with that. It was so much fun. You know, I mean, I was doing design reviews with Dre and Diddy and Will I Am. And one day Oliver Stone came in and he was, you know, it was just like nuts. So I thought, this is cool. You know, again, as long as I don't lose too much money, it's fine. Little did I know it would explode into an international phenomenon, but it did. And, and it was amazing. So a product like this, Robert, it's really got to tap into emotion, a whole myriad uh, set of emotions to get people, the you know, new customers excited about it. It's got to kind of give a similar feel to Dre's music or the music that people are passionate about. How do you think about that relationship between design and emotion? It's really an important one. And, and when I look back at how Beats became so successful, it was through culture. And if you think about it, culture is where art and commerce meet. It's the point when you have something that is highly creative, strikes a chord, and then turns into commercial success, you know, is in culture. And the thing that, you know, there's a lot of the success was due to the design and the, and the brand that we developed. But a lot of it had to do with Jimmy and his team understanding the notion of cultural relevance and how do you create that. How do you put something into the cultural conversation in real time and leverage that into success? And so from the design point of view, you know, what we really wanted to do and were successful at was building one of these transformative products. You know, if you were a kid, when you put those headphones around your neck, you know, put on your Adidas and walked out of your house, you became somebody else, right? You, you transformed into another place. You were accessing that energy of Dre and everything that went along with it. That was something we managed to do with the design in that it was worked really well. It was beautiful, but also iconic in a way that when you wore it, it had very strong representation. And that, I think, was one of the powerful things about it. You know, and then, you know, of course, what, what Jimmy did was every video that went out of Universal Music at the time had the headphones in it. You know, sometimes as a star, sometimes as a bit player, but it was always, you know, associated with what was going in culture at that time. And that, and then additionally was to move into sports and athletics. And again, it was the same thing. It wasn't, there was this connection between athletes and training and music, 
that allowed that transition. But again, it was sort of bringing the headphone into that cultural conversation around athletic superstars and who they were and how they trained. And so all those associations, when you tie it in with a very iconic design, is like gasoline on the fire. You've had these success stories like Beats at Ammunition. What are you excited about working on next? It's interesting for us right now. We, as a studio, you know, outside of the Beats work, really grew from the explosion in, in hardware startups, you know, in the, you know, sort of 2014 to 2018, 19 timeframe, right? It just, there was so much going on with early stage companies in hardware. And so we, we really became the go-to studio to work with these organizations, which was fantastic. And we really enjoyed, uh, I say when I left Pentagram, I was really growing very tired of the sort of Fortune 500 stuff because it would be really hard to move the needle, right? You'd work, you know, with a client for years and maybe only see one or two good things come out of it, right? And, and that actually kind of hurts your visibility, right? And that you're not really able to do good work. And it's just, you know, unless you're, you know, working at the highest level, and even then it's very hard to create change in organizations like that. On the other hand, you get a startup founder led small organization passionate about doing one thing and bringing it out into the world and one thing that usually hasn't been done before that's amazing we're a designer and so we really pivoted towards doing that kind of work and it was fantastic and you know we didn't talk a lot about the formation of ammunition but there were a few things that i felt were really important about starting a new studio i, I think you know the first was what i could see happening in the in the business world was this growing understanding of the value of industrial design you know, within the business world, you know, and, and really that was driven by companies like Apple that, you know, whether it was the iPod, iMac, iPhone, right? Seeing the success and the impact that design had in creating those world changing products. You know, while Pentagram was great, I wasn't really positioned right to take advantage of that. And so that was one reason for starting ammunition. The, the second was that, you know, through my time at Apple, I'd learned that great products were more than objects and they were about ideas and they were, they were embodied and those were created in a multidisciplinary fashion, right? So it wasn't just an industrial designer creating a great object and figuring out how to manufacture it. It was everything about that, right? I used to, um, when I'd lecture, I'd pull up my iPhone and say, close your eyes now, you know, and imagine this thing and take away the logo take away the operating system, take away the packaging, take away your experience of buying it when you went to the Apple store, or take away you know, all those things and what do you have left? You have a nice object, but you don't have an iPhone. It's all those things. So, you know, in order to create great products, you had to do all those things and do them really well and have a very consistent, compelling thread that runs through it. And so that was part of, you know, how we set up the studio and that we had, it's multi, it's a multidisciplinary studio, but with products at the center. But getting back to while I was talking about startups, the third piece was that I had this epiphany and it kind of came through beats and also through, I'd done another little startup, which I invested in and it was called Fuego, which was a barbecue company. And I began to realize that as designers, we actually give away intellectual property really cheaply. You know, I was happy to get a project. It was a cool project. And as long as I got enough budget to do the project and pay my team and myself, I was happy, right? And then I'd see this intellectual property we created go out into the world and create hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And then I had friends who were software engineers that would write some code and retire, you know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, there's some disparity here in these models. I, I should, you know, figure this out. So what we started to do when we started ammunition was to focus on different types of relationships. Some were the sort of beats like partnerships and, you know, and revenue sharing, but with the startups, we started to uh, invest in them and we developed some models where we could convert part of our fee into equity. Something really interesting happened out of that was that of course, you know, there's, we've had some exits, we've had some failures, we've got some things still going, but, it sort of changed the way we worked in that, you know, we, we sort of went from being this vendor or hired gun to being part of the business who we also, you know, had skin in the game and our clients treated us differently. They listened to us more. 
we really internalized the business objectives much more significantly because, you know, that was how we were going to be successful. And to the point where even didn't, it didn't matter whether we were hired on a traditional fee-for-service model or we were doing a partnership, we behaved the same, you know, which actually got us fired a few times. But um, so that, you know, was really, you know, the heaviest growth period of ammunition was participating in those early stage companies and helping them not just build a product, but build a business. Where we are today, though, is kind of interesting because you probably are aware of the funding for hardware startups is literally gone, right? It's there's a relatively small number of companies that come in in relative to what it was five years ago. Unless they manage to shoehorn AI into their products somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's always, that's the other thing that's wild when you, you sit back and you in this industry for a while that you see the trends and there's sort of a lemming like behavior when something becomes hot, everybody jumps on that. You're right. You know, as long as I got an, you know, for a while it was, as long as I got an app, right. It doesn't matter. Right. Just, you know, now it's, if if we have an AI component, but you know, what we've been doing successfully now, which is kind of fun is sort of making this adjustment to, you know, what we, we really learned how to do really well during that period, you know, from 2014 on was, you know, helping people create things that hadn't been made before, hadn't been done before. And we got very good at that. And so what we've started to do is basically work with larger organizations that need the same thing, right? There's, you know, what happens with companies is it becomes really difficult for them to innovate and move outside of what they know how to do. So we've found this spot for our studio where we go into organizations and begin to work with them and figure out how to create this new thing they don't know how to do or have been unable to do or don't have the talent to do or whatever. That's sort of starting to fuel another period of growth for our office. And it's, and it's really fun and exciting to be able to be in that position and with well-funded organizations that have an initiative to go out and create something new and be able to work with them to do that. A lot of our listeners are in the software space. And though, you know, design is design, industrial design and software design, there are some key differences in workflow and even some of the philosophy. And, you know, as a product designer myself, industrial designers that I've worked with in the software space, I see that they think a little bit differently in an interesting way. I wonder if you have thoughts about that, how industrial designers and software designers think differently and work differently. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is interesting. I mean, we have our own... UX team. We do a lot of integrated hardware software work. I mean, again, that's sort of back to this idea, if you're going to create something great, you can't really isolate the two. But then you, when you get into it, it's it, we always have this interesting battle, even in, internally, where the way that I've always worked is, and successfully so, is to start off thinking very broad, right? Look at something from a 360 degree view. And for a while, you know, for some period, it's like, it's like I, I drive my research team crazy because we do a fair amount of upfront work, you know, and, and, you know, around this sort of idea we coined, which is, you know, figuring out what's worth designing in the first place before we start designing it. So we'll do this work and, and research, and then we'll sort of take it and put it in a drawer for a while, right? Because I think it's really important conceptually to look at things unconstrained initially, you know, to see what you'll find. And then you can come back and sort of lay those requirements on top of it and see if you can make it work or you figure out what requirement needs to change or whatever. But, you know, so you do this. So, but what I've found with our um, UX UI designers is they take a much more linear functional approach to the work, you know, and, and as you said, we'll start out with requirements and then they'll um, move into different steps into wireframes and, you know, and sort of do a lot of design work before they even start looking at it in a visual sense. And so we, we, had, we butt heads a lot around that. And I kind of gave up trying to, to force them to think like I do. It's sort of, we just sort of figure out the right points to join together, right? And the part that does work really well is, you know, we have this function in our team, which you guys are probably are aware of, called service design. And that's really looking at the sort of biggest picture of how this thing and what it does and the business all sort of mesh together. So we spend a lot of time as an overall team in that area of trying to figuring out, you know, just from a you know, conceptual point of view, how should this thing behave and what should it do and, you know, so forth. You know, then we go off and do our own things and come together at different points to check in on how it meshes. And that sort of using that concept of service design has really helped sort of marry the industrial designers and the UX people together very closely to sort of gain a, a momentum around things. 
Robert, this has been a fascinating conversation, but before we close out, curious what you're reading, watching, listening to that has you excited and curious. When I come to reading, I have two sides. One is I read really trashy crime and detective novels for entertainment, right? I mean, I can read an entire Michael Connelly book on a flight to New York, right? <laughs> and so, and so I'll, I'll do that. But then I also have this stack of books around spirituality and health. I've been become fascinated with, I don't know if you know, Dr. Mark Hyman and, and longevity and sort of reversing the aging process. You know, I won't tell you how old I am, but and then it's sort of spirituality and mental health. And, you know, so, I, but those books like will take me a month to read. Right. And it's the same thing. I've also, you know, by what I'm watching, the shows that I watch now are the last of us and poker face, <laughs> um, you know, so there's, but at the same time, my wife and I have been diving more deeply into quantum theory and trying to understand more about what that means and the idea of time and, and that's kind of come back to something that I found very fascinating. I started to think about things very differently in that I used to think I just, you know, had this, you know, ability that a lot of people have to visualize, right? But then I also began to realize I also have ability to manifest, right? I have this, you know, that, that this is a very valuable thing if you can visualize something and then manifest it. And I've started to wonder about this. You, know, you guys are probably, if you haven't studied quantum theory, I think I'm a little nutty, but, you know, this sort of notion about, is what really going on is that am I able to go forward in time and see something, right? And come back and then chart a course to get there, right? Because as you start to study quantum theory, you realize that time doesn't work the way that we really think it does. And there are actually very probably many parallel time paths that you move back and forth on, right? So I'm just starting to dive into that and I find it fascinating and I find it mind boggling that some of the concepts that I've spent most of my life understanding about reality may in fact not exist. So, so that's kind of where I am, but enjoying trying to understand and learn more about it. What a great place to wrap things up. So Robert Bruner, thanks so much for joining us on the Design Better podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's been a blast. Eli and I love producing this podcast. But sometimes we find ourselves wondering, what sort of feedback does our audience have? How could we improve the show? Maybe you could help us by taking just a couple minutes to complete a survey, answering a few questions about your thoughts about the show, sharing your feedback, and telling us a little bit about you. To take the survey, just go to dbtr.co slash survey. That's dbtr.co slash survey. Our thanks in advance for completing the survey. It'll really help us improve the show. This episode was produced by Eli Woolery and me, Aaron Walter, with engineering and production support from Brian Paik of Pacific Audio. If you found this episode useful, we hope that you'll leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to finer shows. Or simply drop a link to the show in your team's Slack channel, designbetter.com slash podcast. It'll really help others discover the show. Until next time.